Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Let's read again our scripture reading from this morning. Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I also have been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way which I ought to speak. Pray for us, Paul says, that our preaching would be clear. Joe and I feel that prayer too. And you do that frequently. Oftentimes the opening prayer, the brother that is leading that will pray for the speaker of the hour. I know it's hard to know who's preaching sometimes. So you come up to lead the prayer and you don't know if you should say Ben or Joe. So the safe way is just say, pray for the speaker of the hour. But whoever is preaching that day, whether it's me or Joe, I will tell you, we appreciate that prayer. Because we want our preaching, as Paul said here, to be clear. We want it to be made manifest. In verse 2, he says, devote yourselves to prayer. There's an article in the bulletin this morning that has to do with taking time to pray. I think that is a struggle for us. I know it is a struggle for me oftentimes, and I'm sure that it is for you. And Paul says that we should devote ourselves to that, but notice how he follows that up. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. Being watchful, some translations say. Sometimes we lay down in our beds at night and we pillow our heads and we think, I should pray before I go to bed. I don't know about you, but when I do that, I find that I'm not very alert in those prayers. I am not very watchful. I I begin well. I start off. I start off just fine, but, well, that pillow feels really comfortable. And I begin to drift off into sleep. Praying with alertness. Paul encourages us to do that. But I want to emphasize what he says in verse 3. And I want us to focus our study this morning from Colossians 4 and verse 3. When Paul says, pray for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word. Pray that God will open up a door for us. Now, Paul is frequently asking God's people to pray for open doors. Paul wants the gospel to succeed. He wants the gospel to spread. He wants more and more people to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Paul is asking the Colossians to pray for this. But please don't miss what he says at the end of verse 3. For which I have also been imprisoned. When Paul writes the Colossian letter, he is in jail. What kinds of opportunities is he going to have from a prison cell? Why is he asking the Colossian brethren to pray for open doors for the word of the gospel? If anything, wouldn't he be saying, pray that the prison doors would open so I can bust out of here? But Paul's focus is on the success and the furtherance of the gospel while he is in prison. In verse 18, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. 
Okay, I have delayed as long as I can. This wretched clicker. <laughs> you know, I was a pitcher in college, and I've been really tempted to take this thing and just throw it against the wall and show off my arm. But my arm ain't what it used to be, so I'm, I've never done that. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Let's see if we're clicking now. There we go. Pun intended. We're going to do a little traveling with Paul today. And we are going to try and make sense of this request that he makes in Colossians 4 and verse 3 when he prays for an open door. I want us to look at some things that have happened in Paul's life leading up to this point. As Paul is searching for open doors, even as he is a prisoner, God answers this prayer for him and he opens many doors to him. So go with me to Acts chapter 21. That's where we begin. We begin at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. In Acts chapter 21, Paul has now come to the end of this third journey and he ends the journey in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 21, beginning at verse 10, he says, As we were staying there for some days, this is in the city of Caesarea, if you go back to verse 8, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Agabus the prophet tells Paul, when you get to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested. The Jews will arrest you and you will be handed over to the Gentiles, to the Romans. So in verse 12, when we, Luke says, when we heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul is not going to be persuaded. He is going to go to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, this prophecy of Agabus is proven true. He is arrested in the temple, and this arrest leads to his imprisonment. First in Caesarea, where he will be for two years, and then the book of Acts ends with Paul and Luke on a ship to the city of Rome. And in Acts chapter 28, when Paul makes it to Rome, he is under house arrest. He is in prison in Rome for two more years. So Paul is a prisoner for at least four years and probably a little bit more than that. So when Paul is taken into custody in Acts chapter 21, what kinds of opportunities would he have presented to him to teach the word of God? You wouldn't think he would have very many. But in fact, he has at least nine that we're going to talk about this morning. In Acts chapter 22, he is given the opportunity to address a mob in Jerusalem. And we're not going to read uh, several of these passages because they're large narrative sections in the book of Acts. But he is given the opportunity to address a mob who was calling for his arrest and his mistreatment. So he preaches to that mob. Then if you go to Acts chapter 22, at the end... Beginning at verse 30, the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released Paul and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble, brought Paul down and set him before them. So now as you roll into chapter 23, he is going to be given the opportunity to preach to the Jewish council or to the Sanhedrin. In Acts chapter 24, 25, and 26, he will preach before Felix later Festus, as well as King Agrippa. 
These are powerful, influential rulers and governors. And Paul has the opportunity to stand before them and preach the gospel of Christ. When you go to Acts chapter 27, we are now on the ship that will carry him to the city of Rome. And the text says in Acts chapter 27 that there are 270 people on the ship. And Paul has the opportunity to preach to them. Open doors all along as Paul is a prisoner. Well, this ship suffers a shipwreck. And when they come to chapter 28, they land on a small island called Malta. And in chapter 28 and in verse 7, and we are going to read this, Acts 28 and verse 7, Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed, afflicted with a recurring fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and being cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect. And when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all that we needed. Now, I know that it doesn't say there that Paul was doing a lot of preaching to those people. But don't you think that would have naturally come as a consequence of his healing all of these people on that island? How could this man do this? What kind of magic is this? Well, it's not magic. Let me tell you about Jesus of Nazareth. In chapter 28, they set sail from Malta, and in verse 16, they come into the city of of Rome. He was allowed to stay by himself, verse 16 says, with the soldier who was guarding him. And now Paul is going to have opportunities here in the city of Rome to preach to many. While Paul is in prison, while Paul is in prison in Rome for two years, more opportunities come. People are coming to hear what he has to say. He does have, while under house arrest, some flexibility and freedom. He is not locked in a dungeon, completely excluded from all outside contact. But he's also not a free citizen to get up and go and come as he pleases. But people are coming to him because they've heard about him. And they want to find out, who is this man? And what is he preaching? So for two years in Rome, he will have opportunities to teach any who come to him. One of the people who finds his way to Paul is a man named Onesimus. Onesimus is from the city of Colossae. He is a slave who belongs to his master Philemon. Onesimus runs away from his home in Colossae, he runs away from his master Philemon, which in the first century was a crime punishable by death, by the way. He runs away and he leaves to go to the city of Rome. Look in the map in the back of your Bible. That is not a short trip. Find Colossae, find Rome. And what you'll see in between them is a lot of land and even more sea. Somehow... Providentially, Onesimus finds the Apostle Paul. How do you just happen upon a prisoner? How does, how does that happen? Well, God made it happen. Onesimus finds Paul, and Paul teaches him about the gospel. Go with me to Colossians chapter 4 again. Let's look at a different verse this time. Colossians chapter 4, Onesimus has been converted, and Paul tells Onesimus something that he doesn't want to hear. You have to go home. You have to go back to your master Philemon. 
So look with me in Colossians 4 and in verse 7 beginning. Paul writes, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him is Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Think about this. Paul sends Onesimus back to the church in Colossae and he says, this man is now your brother in the Lord. Welcome him as a brother in Christ. So Tychicus is carrying this letter, Paul's epistle to the Colossians. He's carrying that as Paul's messenger to take it back to Colossae. And with him is this runaway slave who's been converted. An open door was given to the apostle while he was in prison. Onesimus is traveling back, thinking the entire time, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to go back to my master Philemon. I don't know how this is going to turn out for me. Well, Paul has already thought about that. Onesimus also has a letter in hand. Paul's letter to Philemon. So when Paul writes this letter to his dear friend, in verse 10 of Philemon, Paul says to his friend, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Philemon, I know what the law allows you to do to Onesimus. But you need to understand that things are different now. The situation has changed. He is not just a servant anymore. Now he's your brother in Christ. And so I am begging you that you treat him as a good brother. And I know that you will do that. Let's go to the book of Philippians. What other opportunities does Paul have while he is a prisoner? Well, in Philippians chapter 1, he tells us about some opportunities that he has had with the soldiers who are watching over him. Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, prison, that's what he's referring to, have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. I am in prison, and yet I am having opportunities. The soldiers of the Praetorian Guard who are keeping watch over me, I am having influence with them. I am able to teach them and talk to them. What a great opportunity is available to me. But it doesn't just that. He says in verse 14 that there are other brethren who are in Rome, who are here around me, who know about my circumstances. And they have been encouraged through me. And so now God's people are becoming more bold and more strong because of the things that have happened to Paul. Go to chapter 4. Look at verse 22. Chapter 4, verse 22, Paul says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Paul is even having influence in the family of Caesar through his imprisonment. How is that possible? How is it that a lowly Jewish prisoner is able to have such a wide reach? It's because God is opening doors to him. God is giving him opportunities even though he is a prisoner. And the final opportunity that I want you to consider are these prisoners.
prison epistles that we've been reading from. During this Roman imprisonment that begins at the end of the book of Acts, that's Paul's first Roman imprisonment, Philemon, Colossians, Philippians, and Ephesians. Four letters that Paul writes during that imprisonment. Well, what kinds of open doors would be provided there? Think of all the good that his teaching in those epistles did when it went to those respective people and churches. Think about the good that Paul's prison letters are doing today. Letters that the Holy Spirit wrote 2,000 years ago, still speaking truth to us today. That door is still open. A door that was first opened when the door on Paul was closed. These are just the opportunities that we know about from the New Testament that Paul had during that first imprisonment. I'm sure there are others that, that Luke did not record for us. Others that Paul did not mention for us. Are you seeing the point that I'm making? And when Paul writes to the Colossians and he says, pray that God would open doors for us, all of these things have already happened. He's already seen these doors being opened. And he says, I know I'm a prisoner, but look at what God has already done in my imprisonment. Please pray for more. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're moving ahead in Paul's life. He is released from that first imprisonment in Rome and he leaves Rome and he travels far and wide again. New Testament doesn't record very much about that. Just little snippets here and there. But later on, he would be arrested a second time and imprisoned in Rome. And this second time in Rome... He is not under the same conditions that he was before. In fact, with the first Roman imprisonment, he knew that there was no case against him and that he had every expectation to be released. In the second imprisonment, even though there's still no case against him, he does not expect to be released this time. He knows his death is imminent. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I want you to notice what he says beginning at verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. What a powerful statement. I am a prisoner, but God's word is not. God's word is free. God's word is able to be spread far and wide because God is opening doors. I love Paul's attitude. Don't you think about Acts 16 when he and Silas were on the second journey and they were in prison together in Philippi? What were they doing? Singing. Singing. Now, I probably would have been singing too, but I would have been singing the blues. I would not have been singing hymns like they were. These hardships that Paul faces, uh, of course, it's not what he wants. If he had... If he had things his way, he would be out and about free and teaching. And uh, Of course he would, but these hardships, difficult as they were, he recognized opportunities can flow from these hardships. So despite his imprisonments and the mistreatment that he suffered, the gospel of Christ, through him, continued to be effective. And there are some really good lessons for us to think about. 
as we consider all of these open doors that God gave to Paul. So let's go through three applications very quickly, and then we'll be done. The first one is this. God can open doors when doors seem to be shut. Would Paul have expected that all of these opportunities would come to him when he is in chains? I suppose he might have, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have. If I had been imprisoned as the apostle was, I would have thought that my imprisonment would have meant the end of my opportunities. But Paul continued to see his imprisonment as a means to effective ministry. He's not wallowing in self-pity. He's not lamenting those deplorable circumstances saying, well, I guess I just can't do anything for the Lord's cause anymore. No, for Paul, it just meant he had to be creative and find new ways to be busy in the kingdom. I think you and I would have assumed that the gospel could never be effective under those circumstances. But God shows us that he can and he does create opportunities when opportunities seem unlikely. I think there are times when you and I, as we think about opportunities to share the message of the scripture, you and I may come up with a number of reasons as to why we can't do that. And maybe we're like Moses and we say, listen, I'm not an eloquent speaker and I kind of stammer over myself and I'm, I'm struggling with what to say. Or we may be like Jonah and we may run in the opposite direction and say, well, I don't really like those people anyway, so I don't want to go and preach to them. We may come up with any number of excuses as to why we can't do things, as to why the power of God would be limited in our lives, as to why the opportunities are simply not there for me. And yet here's Paul saying, really? What are you dealing with in comparison to what I faced? And look at the open doors that God provided for me. So, if we feel guilty about that point, yeah, okay, you're right. I've never dealt with the things Paul dealt with, and he had all these doors. Maybe I should be open to having open doors as well. Then the second thing that we need to think about, the second thing Paul teaches us here, is that we need to pray in faith, asking God for those opportunities. Isn't that what Paul did in Colossians 4? He wrote to the church and he said, Brethren, pray for us. Devote yourselves to prayer and pray that God would open doors for us. This is what Paul wanted them to do for him. And so we too must ask God to open doors for us. But I'm reminded of what James says in James chapter 1. In James 1, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, you remember this? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you lack something, ask God for it. But James qualifies that in verse 6 when he says, But he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. If you ask God, ask in faith. We must ask God to give us open doors. But we must ask with the expectation that he will actually do it. I've heard an illustration before, and I'm sure you have too, that the man who prays for rain and yet goes outside without an umbrella 
is not asking in faith. If you're asking in faith, you take the umbrella with you because you believe you're actually going to need it. God, open doors for me. That's a great thing to pray. But we have to mean it when we pray it. We have to ask from genuine faith. And I think part of what this involves is an awareness to have our eyes opened so that we will see the opportunities as they come along. I think about Paul in prison in Philippi in Acts 16. You have to think that they were praying for an opportunity to be released. But who would have ever thought that that opportunity for release would have come in the form of an earthquake? Probably weren't expecting that. But maybe just the guard coming with the key and unlocking the door. That would have been a lot simpler. When Paul was in Corinth in Acts chapter 18, a, a city that has been likened to modern day Las Vegas, surely he looks around and he thinks, I'm not going to have any success here. These people don't care anything about spiritual things. And yet, in Acts 18, the Lord Jesus spoke to him and said, settle in here. You're going to be here for a while. I have many people in this city. And Paul stays there for a year and a half. Listen, I've been to Vegas. 18 hours was enough for me in that city. 18 months Paul stays and has an effective ministry. When you pray for opportunities, ask in faith, knowing that God can and will bring them to you. And the final thing I want us to think about is this. Something Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 29. To everyone who has, more shall be given. You remember the parable of the talents? That's when Jesus said this, Matthew 25 and verse 29. The one talent man took what had been given to him and he buried it in the ground. He did nothing with that talent. He wasted the opportunity. And so his master took the talent away from him and he gave it to the man who had doubled his talents from five to ten. He now has eleven because he had proven himself to be faithful in his charge. Paul was faithful with the opportunities that the Lord had given to him. And so the Lord gave him more. Paul has proven himself to be an effective worker in the Lord's service, and so the Lord gave him more and more opportunities, even when it seemed like opportunities would be limited. And so it is with us. If we are faithful in the opportunities that we have, God will give us more. I'm choosing my words carefully, and I don't want you to miss this. If we are faithful in the opportunities, how do we define that? Well, it's defined by conversions. How many people we bring to Christ, that's how we determine faithfulness. No. What we are called to do, beloved, is to share the message. We are not responsible for someone's response to it. Paul had many people, many thousands of people who rejected his message. Their response is not what determined whether or not he was faithful in the opportunities he was given. Paul's faithfulness was determined by the fact that he took advantage of the opportunity to speak. I look back over so many opportunities in my own life where I missed the chance to say what needed to be said. Some of those people that I have had opportunities to speak with open doors that were put right in front of my face. Some of those people are now dead and gone. I 
I look back on those with regret, wishing that I had said something different, wishing that I had said something at all. But due to fear or due to discomfort or due to awkwardness or due to whatever, I failed to speak. And the only thing I can do is to resolve to not let that happen anymore. I think we have much to learn from the Apostle. His eyes were always open, looking for opportunities. And so, brethren, I want to encourage you to be looking for opportunities this week. They will come. They will come from your friends. They will come from your co-workers. They may come from your children. Don't let an opportunity to speak slip away. Perhaps there's someone here this morning who feels the door of your heart opening up to Jesus Christ. Don't close it. Open that door wide and let him into your heart. And maybe that's you this morning. We've had two. In the last week, we've had three in the last five or six weeks who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing that brings us more joy than to see that. So if we can help you with that this morning, we invite you. Please come right now 